Assalamu alaikum everyone. This is Amar bin Salim and I'm very, very excited to be welcoming you to the episode three of Out Loud with Amar, my own podcast series. And again, you know, the underlying commitment is still the same to come up with quality content, the, the content that can actually uh, add value to your life, to your way of thinking. And over the past few weeks, I've been having a lot of meetings with different people in the education sector, people, you know, who were one way or another, they were linked um, uh, they were linked to the education sector and they keep asking me questions, questions I have answered so many times, questions I have also, you know, in the, uh, a couple of years back, I tried uh, to find the answers to. And when I did, I tried helping other people. But then again, you know, uh, these questions still come up. Some of those questions are, what is schooling? Se kya میں और जब बच्चे ने जो है यूनिवर्सिटी सेम ही पढ़नी है चाहे वो ओ लेवल्स का बच्चा हो या एफएससी का बच्चा उसने सेम ही यूनिवर्सिटी में जाना है तो फिर ओ लेवल्स और ए लेवल्स के खर्चे क्यों बर्दाश्त किए जाएं इसमें क्या है अब कई दफा तो मैंने इन सवालों के आंसर देने की कोशिश की और जब लोगों के ये सवाल आते रहे तो कई जगहों पे कभी-कभी मेरे कुछ अपने सवाल आते होते थे उनमें से एक क्वेश्चन जो है वो ये था कि सिंगल नेशनल करिकुलम क्या बुला है तो कभी हम गेस्ट बन गए कभी हमने गेस्ट बुलाए और खास तौर से मुझे कराची वालों का और सिंध का ओपिनियन जानने में ज्यादा मैं इंटरेस्टेड हूं और उसकी रीजन ये नहीं है कि मैं लाहौर से हूं उसकी रीजन बेसिकली ये है कि जो इंप्लीमेंटेशन थी सिंगल नेशनल करिकुलम की वो इंप्लीमेंटेशन फेज में रोक दी गई थी सिंध की तरफ से तो مختلف पर्सपेक्टिव्स जो है वो जानने की कोशिश है बेसिकली एंड अगेन आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू बी योर ओनली स्पीकर यू हैव हर्ड फ्रॉम मी न्यूमरस टाइम्स यू हैव बीन हियरिंग from me you've been watching my videos to aaj jo hai maine ek khas guest hai unko request ki to join me and she's joining me from uh, karachi uh, i'm very very thankful to my guest rukaiya salman uh, mm-hmm. rukaiya is presently working as the head at cedar school system in karachi she is a graduate she did her bs in 2006 from lums then she went on and pursued her uh, cfa and she is a chartered financial analyst as well Moreover, she holds a postgraduate certificate in education international from uh, from Nottingham University. And then she is a remarkable education leader working with the education sector for over 14 years. Thank you so much, Rukaiya, for joining us today. Thank you for having me over here. <laughs> Hello. And the players indeed are. Uh, Rukaiya, the important question, the big question that affects everyone, is what are your O-levels and grades? Kya the? Okay. <laughs> it was like now I think we didn't have I can tell you not a problem. So, <laughs> so basically I think we didn't so have bilkul, bilkul, please, but... <laughs> Yeah, it was I think seven A's and three B's. But we didn't have A stars at that time, like at so... 90. <laughs> yeah. I am sure it used to be like A's at that time. Yeah, so we didn't have A stars, but the A was at a 90, so a was at a 90. A, I think now A star is 90 and yeah, 90 and beyond. Yeah. Okay, so if okay. you but want, I was getting yeah. it. So if you like <laughs> convert it, no, no, no. If you convert it to today's, uh, you know, rate, then that's seven A stars and three A's. But at that time, it was seven A's and three B's. Okay, okay, okay. And I do the same thing. I student they ask me what my grades were in, in O-levels. I do the same thing. I tell them that A star not a star, so now A or two B. Rukaiya, you went to LUMS, you did your BSc, uh, as you were just telling me before the program, and you majored in accounting and finance. Uh, then you did your uh, CFA. So, log to iske generally corporate sector join kar lete hain what made you you know what made you join the education sector yeah so uh, basically i was um, in the financial sector for a few years especially during the years i was doing my cfa you know level 1 level 2 and level 3 
but you know i did I, but i did a lot of teaching while i was at lums also i was a ta for two you know good years and i was doing a lot of volunteer uh, you know teaching also in care school in lahore and during my o and a level years also at fps and grammar school karachi grammar school but so i always knew that i wanted to enter the education sector because one thing that is very attractive about it is that you never stop learning you know we have the opportunity to enhance our skills further with training and also like developing our knowledge can kind of help us to access new and different approaches to help people it's not just the you know school staff that we have the ability to make a difference to we also have the ability to change children's lives so i think uh, that's a very you know uh, you know like i think that's the best part about uh, the education sector that you can make a big difference exactly i think as a teacher um uh, whoever joins the profession the main idea is the same at least it was it was very very close to my heart very very significant for me that i wanted to you know uh, somehow add value to uh, to to my students and not just yes. one student because then it takes a lot of time to bring change uh, to yes. every student who i was teaching yes sorry sorry no i'm saying to a lot of students because especially like a lot of people from my batch they are currently abroad and if i was living in mm-hmm. pakistan then i felt you know the best way to give back to the country is by contributing to the education system like you know it 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 kind of makes a lot of sense at that point it does because it has a lasting impact and not yes. just on on you but the generations to come yes definitely bilkul bilkul say rukaiya a very significant uh, you know uh, I, i i don't know if i should be saying it an achievement uh, or uh, mm. should be remarking it as something entirely different but a very significant step that has been taken by the government is the introduction of the single national curriculum now yeah. um, all of us were aware of the fact that all the stakeholders from different provinces in pakistan they were on board uh, mm. there, there were people from punjab there were people from sindh and kpk and balochistan and in other areas as well and then it was agreed that the single national curriculum uh you know uh, would be uh, uh would be implemented and then uh, during the implementation phase we saw that the single national curriculum was not a national curriculum anymore because sind opted out of it out. so 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 what's the reason because because i have been you know conversing uh, about the snc uh, with with so many education leaders and mm. i haven't been able to you know get the right idea as to why sind you know didn't go ahead with it yeah so because i'm working with the private sector and not really with the government sector i might not have the right answer myself but like what i think i can tell you because what basically i think happened must have happened is that uh, i'm not sure if this was the right solution because pakistan's education system as a whole you know is quite intricate with variety of factors impacting it and influencing it and this can be a whole separate discussion in itself right and as far as since decision to opt right. out of it is concerned i'm sure that they had their valid and well thought out reasons because the people at the top and at the government level are very well aware of the ground level issues you know that are affecting the growth and the enrollment rates in sind and how the government uh, you know how you know what kind of curriculum works in government schools what kind of curriculum works in in private schools so i feel like the ones who opted out of it must have had good reasons for it but obviously because we belong to the private sector we don't know exactly what made them drop out but we like you know um, we should give them credit that maybe they took the right decision you know they must be having good reasons for it and those reasons like i said could be you know that are uh, like you know we have a population with a lot of different backgrounds and there are a lot of factors that affect the education system also so probably they felt this was not the right fit you know but again not but, but, but no, do you think that it kind of contradicts the uh, the whole uh, thinking or the whole idea of introducing a single national curriculum when you see that uh, all of these people i mean uh, all of these education educators and educationists in punjab kp came blow just on they went on and implemented the the so maybe the they're taking that yeah so maybe they're taking their time and maybe we will become part of it but later on maybe after a few revisions are made that is also a possibility right like maybe they are waiting right. for the curriculum to look the way they want it to look like and then sin can adopt it that is also a possibility 
because I know that um, like, you know, in, you're constantly making revisions in SNP. There's a lot of work happening. A lot of people are being hired to come up with uh, a good plan. So maybe uh, Sindh can join it later on once the plan looks fit for the you know province. That is also a possibility. Exactly, exactly. Bilkul say. And we'll come back to single national curriculum. Isko okay. se zane nahi okay. to this topic. Okay. <laughs> but 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 yeah, I have another question for you right now. And has uh, been there for a while. And this is that education or talim jo hai Pakistan ke there has this become a business in Pakistan because matlab, mm-hmm. you go to these tier one institutions, they're charging like forty thousand rupees or fifty thousand rupees. That's a, that's a lot of money. And अक्सर जगहों पर यह बहस हो रही होती है कि पाकिस्तान में जो एजुकेशन सिस्टम है वो बेसिकली जो है बिजनेस बन चुका है चुका है अब उसका जो है तरबियत से ताल्लुक नहीं था सो डू यू थिंक दैट यू नो फोकस हैज मूव्ड अवे फ्रॉम तालीम और हैज यू नो का I don't think so. And I can give you my reasons for that as to why, you know, maybe the private sector is charging more. You know, I'm a, I was a business student, right? So uh, not that I will defend capitalism, but I'll just give you my own, uh, you know, a viewpoint on it. So basically, uh, you know, citizens of Pakistan who belong to the upper strata of the economy, and that's the case everywhere. Everywhere, you, you know, in every developed country, you have different classes, you know, the upper middle class, the middle class. And then that class demands an education that is at par with international star- standards, right? And thus enroll their kids in private schooling because even abroad, you have private and public schools both. And private schools charge a higher fee as compared to the government school. And you can't ignore the fact that the facilities which are provided by, you know, the private schools in Karachi, like if you look at the campuses, the canteen class, classrooms, the ed tech facilities, sports, it comes at a cost, right? So even the course books are very different. They're at par with the international standard. Teachers are paid very well, right? And you need the cycle to move for good people to work for you, whether it's the admin staff or teachers. If you want really qualified personnel, you need to pay them well. And to pay them well, you need to earn that amount of money also, right? So I don't think the focus has shifted away from Talim and Tarbiya. Like schools are constantly thriving for innovative learning methods. Like private schools are conducting training and workshops for teachers so that, you know, they can get a hang of various ed tech tools that we introduce. And there are monthly tests to see how the ch- child is improving. There's focus on extracurriculars and the whole child approach. So that's why private schools are charging money because they're offering those uh, facilities, libraries or laboratories. They're paying their teachers. And also this helps us in avoiding brain, like, you know, a lot of people from leaving the country. Because if you're not going to have even educational institutions which are going to pay well, these people are going to leave, you know, and go for a better place, right? So I feel like in every country, a private sector and a public sector go hand in hand. And, you know, this is how it might be different. So maybe Pakistan's education system already has a lack of adequate budget and it will take time for government schools to come up to that level. And I hope it comes up soon. But I don't think that means that we've moved away from Talim. I just feel that all the schools, even public, whether they're private or public schools, they're doing the best they can at the moment to, you know, control the dropout rates and increase the enrollment, especially during COVID, because in a because a lot of families, even in, in the private sector, you know, stopped paying tuition fee and, you know, they dropped out of school because they didn't agree with the whole notion of online classes. So everybody is just trying their best to, you know, make sure that, you know, students are getting educated. So, I mean, we might differ in our exactly. I I've, I've been saying the same things over and over again to the people who have been asking me this. Ke yaar, yeah. matlab, uh, aap ek private school mein jate ho, they charge a lot of money, and I say there's there, there's a proper justification as to why they're charging that kind of money because money. you know they have all the qualified teachers with them. They uh, they invest in teachers training. They exactly. they make sure that you have the latest technology available to you so that the technology yeah. is integrated in the right manner in your classrooms. Exactly. And then they give you access to all these uh, international education, uh, sorry, international uh, universities and international schools as well, and all the collaborations mm-hmm. and everything, and the kind of liberal arts, you know, flavor that we are, that we are trying to uh, give Again. to our students, school-going mm-hmm. students. So that is entirely different. That that requires a lot of money, and and I and I totally agree. But but then the follow-up question is, and uh, 
कि डोंट यू थिंक इट क्रिएट्स अ डिस्पैरिटी बिटवीन डिफरेंट सेगमेंट्स इन द सोसाइटी बिकॉज़ यू नो एक एक किड व बिलोंग्स टू अ वेल्दी फैमिली कैन गो टू अ टियर 1 स्कूल बट एट दिस एट द सेम टाइम एन अदर किड गोइंग टू द सेम ग्रेड कैन नॉट गो टू दैट स्कूल एंड कैन नॉट एंजॉय दैट मच देन देन हाउ डू वी आंसर how do we then answer I, this question yeah then i think you can look at financial aid and scholarships right like i do know that a lot of private schools do offer you know scholarships and financial aid so in that case if a child is really bright but you know the issue is that you know lack of financial resources then they can also apply for scholarships right because a lot of schools do have that quota so i mean that is also one way of getting into a private school and if you can't then you can even get good results through a government school and get into a good college and to a good university right so i mean i don't think that can stop a bright child from doing well in life just because he didn't go to a private school like i know a lot of people who are now doing really well and they were probably not from the best schools in karachi but they made their way up so i think if you have the will you know no matter where you are you will make a difference i mean i i truly believe in that because i have seen people make it to the top from there बिल्कुल सही बिल्कुल सही थैंक यू रुकैया अच्छा रुकैया एक 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 और क्वेश्चन जो है एंड दैट इज स्टिल बिलीव बाय मेनी कि एजुकेशन स्पेशली अर्ली ईयर एजुकेशन जो है स्टिल कंसिडर टू बी ए प्रोफेशन ए सेगमेंट इन द एजुकेशन सेक्टर दैट इज डोमिनेटेड बाय बाय वेमेन इट्स इट्स इट इज कंसिडर्ड टू बी अ वेमेन ओरिएंटेड प्रोफेशन सो इज इट ट्रू बिकॉज एंड एंड डू यू थिंक दैट मेल टीचर्स शुड कंसिडर joining the education sector especially to teach early years education because i remember when i uh, when i was teaching at tns beacon house uh, mm-hmm. uh, and i joined in 2015 i think there was one male uh, you know subject specialist who was there or a homeroom teacher and then i was the other one and then he left and then i was the only one who was teaching there for the for the longest time and then there were other male teachers who who joined in and then it was i believe it 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 kind of was an experiment but it turned out to be you know a very pleasant one uh, but but it, in your opinion and i have noticed it, noticed it as well i have had the pleasure of visiting uh, you know hundreds of schools across pakistan and yes uh, 90 to 95% of the people who are working who are teaching there uh, they they are females so 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 what's your take on that sure um i mean i kind of agree with you uh like partially okay i'll tell you why so yes in our country especially like teaching is an overwhelming the female pro- profession if you look at majority of the schools right like probably more than 3 quarters of all teachers especially in the primary level through high school are women and uh, the disparity is you know most pronounced uh, in middle schools where you know mostly like you know 80 to 90% of the teachers are women but there is a reason for that right because what happens is that they are the primary caregivers in their families and therefore women are more attracted to this profession in men because they this way they can have the same schedule as the children you know they can enroll their child in the same school they can go to the school with their child the home time is the same they come back this way they have a uh, like you know like you know like they have a good balance between their work life and their home life so kind of like teaching and admin work is well synchronized with uh their personal life you know they can take out a few years out of work to stay at home and then also return to the profession easily as compared to the corporate sector where if you've not been there for like 2 3 years it's very difficult to come back at that position and you know you know the corporate rivalry and how uh things work over there but having said that i still think that the trend is changing only in our organization there are many men in the profession i have never really done a count but i think it must be like an equal ratio and the number is really high especially in o level and a levels right so your year 10 year 11 year 12 and year 13 has a lot of male teachers a lot of your pe teachers are male teachers a lot of your music teachers are male teachers so at least as far as my uh, or our organization is concerned we have a lot of male teachers and i see a lot of male teachers even in other schools and colleges of karachi in the o and a level sector but i kind of agree with you at the primary level because the scenario is different like if you look at grades such as kg nursery grade 1 grade 2 very few percentage of men are found to be teaching and 
there could be a reason for it but i'm not sure like maybe it's because the early year students like you know the kg and nursery students are very young and when they go to school they long for that motherly instinct you know they want that you know warm person to greet them in the morning and maybe a woman can provide that better maybe a man feels he is not up to that though i don't agree with that i think i mean a male teacher can be a very good kindergarten teacher also but um, that is probably the reason that at the primary level you have more female teachers but especially if you look at karachi and the scenario like grade 8 onwards up till a levels we have a mm -hmm. lot of male teachers who have come into the profession but yes for primary years i feel um the thinking is and the psyche is that you know teaching in early and primary year students is more complementary to women and um, you know but in second year and higher college there are equal opportunities for for males for males who are who who plan like, on teaching early yeah when a cv classes. comes in yeah yeah so when a cv comes in for a kindergarten teacher we don't look at the fact that it's a male teacher or a female teacher you look at qualifications mm -hmm. you look at experience you look at what the child has uh, what the teacher has done and you also look at the demo so it's never like a gen a question of gender but what but if you do uh, if you will conduct your research you will see a lot of women are there because maybe they feel they are more suitable for the job and maybe men feel that they are more suitable for teaching higher levels and this is all my opinion i'm not sure if that is true but this is what i think might have you know caused this this could be of course this could be one of the most significant reasons as to why yeah. there are more women entering the profession uh, but then there's also uh, this idea this there's also this belief Okay, uh, it doesn't pay you as uh, you know comprehensively or as com in a, in a competitive manner as uh, as a corporate organization would. Uh, yeah. But I think that's changing. And in my own experience, Indeed. I have experienced the same thing. And uh, I remember if I had joined a corporate um, uh, corporate commercial mm. uh, right in the beginning of my career, I think I wouldn't have earned as much as I was earning as a teacher when I joined the education sector. And that yeah. also you know allows you to you know uh, maintain a work life balance. and uh, alongside that it also enabled me to you know uh, enter myself in in a couple of other side projects and not only was i you know gaining valuable experience but also you know making money as well so 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 both these things go go hand in hand um, exactly uh, uh, uh rukeya i have a question and i have i've been asked this question um, like like hundreds of times i believe or many times uh हमारे अभी भी माशरे में समझ आता है कि यार ओ ए लेवल्स करने की क्या जरूरत है ओके बाद में अगर आपने उसी सेम यूनिवर्सिटी में जाना है तो एफ एफ सी करके चले जाओ आई कॉम करके चले जाओ ओ एंड ए लेवल्स करके ही क्यों जाना है उसका मैं अक्सर लोगों को बताता हूँ बिकॉज ओ एंड ए लेवल्स गिव्स यू ए न्यू वे टू लुक एट लुक एट यू नो सींग द प्रॉब्लम इन दिन कमिंग अपर सोल्यूशन एंड यू नो इट एक्चुअली चेंजेस योर होल अप्रोच Yeah. and if i have to you know refer to my own experiences i'd say that it changed my personality as well mm -hmm. but in your opinion how do we answer this question ke yaar jana jab ek hi university mein hai to o level karke jao ya fsc karke jao kaun to wahin pe rahe ho so i mean uh, in no way do i think that you know our local system is not good right i mean i feel like you know i do have friends and there were friends of mine even at lums who came from you know matriculation and they were really good students so i feel like you know even if you you know come, if you're coming from matriculation and fsc you can still do well in life you can get into a good college but yes there are some benefits of the cambridge system you know higher secondary and um, like system which has both o and a levels and i can share some of the reasons i mean uh, with you that basically uh, there are no such you know requirements like which subject should you study like for example you can come up with a combination of physics chemistry bio in a levels and as well as law gp and literature right so you can specialize you have the freedom to specialize in subjects that really interest you because you just need to take three a level subjects and then they can be very uh, closely related to the course that you might aspire to study at uh, university right so a levels i feel gives them the you know the option of maintaining a breadth of subjects such as su studying a humanity subjects with maths and combining that with a language such as spanish so that is one advantage definitely and because they have only three subjects so they can really you know go into the depth of that course 
and then obviously like you know cambridge um, like cambridge international which offers o levels and a levels has a lot of recognition all over the world you know like a lot of like um, you know first world countries offer uh, courses by cambridge international so therefore obviously when a university i mean mm -hmm. are um, you know looks at your grades when you apply to them they probably have heard of the cambridge international system more than they've heard of the pakistani system but that doesn't mean that they are not going to consider you as a candidate if you've studied matriculation and you've done fsc is just that uh, because a level uh, cambridge international is so popular and it's in so many different countries of the world that it's more recognized right so therefore you have these um, advantages that you know like you're with your subject selection with recognition ease of getting into good universities and All of that, so you can meet. तो मैं क्या इसपे counter question ये नहीं बनेगा कि फिर वो बच्चे तो वही basically हैं जो कि जिन्होंने बाहर जाके पढ़ने हैं तो फिर ठीक है वो A levels करें यहाँ पे जिन्होंने जाना है वो F S F F C करें वो फिर O levels के बच्चे सिर्फ बाहर जाएं. No 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 I I disagree sort of because it's just not international recognition like I said I would give more weightage to the first point that I stated that is more depth and more breadth right you can take up any combination you want and. Uh, you can you know study that and then that can be very closely related to what you want to study in college like for example i knew that i wanted to be a business student even in my o levels right so i took all business subjects in o levels and i took all business subjects in a levels and then i did my accounting and finance so by the time i went to college you know i had a very good uh, grasp of economics accounts business studies so you know i could really go deep into that so it could be the same with humanities or creative subjects or languages so it i i i would give more weightage to the first reason and that is it allows you to specialize in a in few subjects but it allows you to go into the depth of that it allows you to go into depth bilkul sahi yeah. bilkul theek hai acha rukiya another question how important do you think is a degree in today's world um आजकल हम बात करते हैं स्किल्स की एज अ मैटर ऑफ फैक्ट आई मेड अ वीडियो जस्ट यस टुडे एंड आई वाज एक्चुअली शॉक टू सी द 31% ऑफ द ऑफ द एजुकेटेड यूथ इन पाकिस्तान दे आर जॉबलेस सो एंड देन द द नेशनल थिंग और द और द फर्स्ट थिंग टू डू एंड दैट द थिंग दैट वी ऑलवेज डू इज पुट द ब्लेम ऑन द गवर्नमेंट दैट देयर आर देयर आर यू नो पॉलिसीज एंड दैट देयर आर the right policies and then there are no job opportunities and the government was supposed to you know uh, 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 offer 10 million jobs but there aren't any but at the same time i i do blame the uh, to some extent i do blame the education sector and also the universities who are not focusing on bridging the gap between industry and academia hmm. so what do you think is degree still important or are skills more important okay i um yeah i have changed my opinion over time so like you know when i was in college and like maybe around 13 14 years ago i thought degree was very important right because obviously we saw that only kids um uh, who had good degrees you know from ivy leagues or good universities in pakistan they got better jobs and you know if you did your masters from a really good place you know so it it was really important uh, when it comes to your career so in, we thought that in the eyes of potential employers it will give us that background and foundation you know that you need for your success so you know we all ran after good degrees and good post graduate degrees but now the trend has really changed there was a cambridge conference that i attended and in that they stated that kids who will graduate in 2030 or 2035 they will change their careers 14 to 17 times in their life as compared to our generation which probably goes through a career change only two to three times because i've been i was in finance i came into education even if i change my career that's going to be probably my third and my last move right so that's a total of two to three moves right. but kids who will graduate after 10 to 15 years they will change careers 14 to 17 times because they might enter a a field and there will be automation and they might have to exit that field and enter another field right so at that point their degree might be relevant but their skills are going to be more important because if you are if you have the skill to be flexible to be able to learn to constantly you know educate yourself then only you will be able to exit the industry you just entered 3 years ago and go into another one right you might start a business and you know you might have strict competition so you now we have to prepare our kids and even our school's philosophy is such that we really want to give our kids the right skill set because they're up for a very different kind of competition when they come out of school and colleges right so these soft skills like communication time management 
all of this will help them get better jobs and i mean there's also a shift with these employers like google like i'm sure you must have heard of it right that um, like google and apple are hiring employees who have the skill and they don't really you know worry about the degree so much right google has recently announced um, like many courses they've launched a new selection of courses for google career certificate they don't really look at degrees as much as they look at your skills so i feel like now uh, you don't really need a college degree to make a career for yourself yes college degree makes it easier and it gives you a good pathway mm -hmm. but if you have the right skills then you can still make a good career for yourself but that doesn't so, mean we don't need for a college degree but at the same time we should acquire the a skill set that will help us later on skill set exactly and, and and i mean it it resonates with my point ke um, there are hmm. educationists who say that uh, the purpose of a college degree or a college education is not that you secure a job in the end it's to make you a better citizen it's to make you a better person and where i do not disagree with it uh, and to a major extent yeah. i do agree but if if there's a parent who is spending a lot of money on his or her child's education like like you know in in millions and even if they're not spending uh, that much money still mm -hmm. in today's world you need to you need to have all these skills mm -hmm. that can actually land you a better job and that can actually you know help you make money yes. and it's not difficult for you to live your life and make your ends meet because that's also very important and and at the end of the yeah. day I remember I was visiting Karachi and there was this school where, where I was presenting with 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 a very eminent faculty member at one of these universities in Lahore and he said the most beautiful thing that that mm -hmm. uh, you know there's this understanding that uh, students who are who are studying humanities who are studying anthropology and sociology and disciplines like such they do not have you know bright job prospects and his counter argument was 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 brilliant that the companies in in this era they they look to hire people they they're actually you know actively engaged in hiring those people who are happy with themselves who, who, exactly. who are happy who are happy individuals and if you are a happy exactly. individual if you are enthusiastic if you're very passionate about what you're doing and if if it's you something that it actually gets you to get out of your bed in the morning then yes. i think it, it's it's not very difficult for you to make your way up to the top position in, in wherever yeah. you're working so i totally agree with you like i i'm not saying that students shouldn't get a college degree yes they should but they should also have the right skill set and they should be very flexible because that is because a lot of new fields are coming up like you know producing media content on the web you know like you know so all of these different fields were not there before right like so for that you need the right skill and both can go hand in hand and the prep for that has to start at a much earlier age we can't learn the right skills just at the age of 22 21 or 23 mm -hmm. it has mm -hmm. to start at an earlier age therefore you must have noticed that even the schools are bringing in you know new subjects because that exposes the child to a different world altogether like we mm -hmm. have a curriculum called pshe that talks about social emotional learning and managing your emotions then gp is mandatory in our school then even content on physical education that talks about the anatomy of the body that's mandatory so you need subjects like this and now we've recently offered design and technology so you need subjects like these you know to expose the child to a different skill set like you need to really focus on stem and robotics so the skill set required now is very different and it has to start at an earlier age exactly bilkul exactly. because it's it's difficult or no matter what we say it's difficult to unlearn things and then relearn yeah. a new uh, exactly uh, and final question uh, final question from uh, uh, from the list uh, okay with the onset of the edtech platforms and i know you are also an edtech enthusiast okay. such as you know abab and coursera and airpair and there are multiple other uh, edtech uh, startups are we yeah. looking at the possibility of a reduced need for a traditional schooling hmm. i don't think so i mean it i i can give you my reason for that <laughs> so i understand that a lot of schools are offering a lot of edtech tools you know with new instructional practices and they have like you know a lot of benefits like i'm you know the uh, like you know the biggest supporter of edtech tools we've launched many at cedar school like you know we have cognity we have chem and mm -hmm. we have ixl and you name it and you know there are like you know we have an uh, L, we had an lms so and an sis system so yes all of that is there but uh, the availability of technology is necessary but it's not sufficient it's but not sufficient condition for effective learning 
you know because yes edtech really helped us to keep learning despite the school lockdown because zoom helped us to take online classes google classroom helped us you know to like it served as an lms like a learning management system and a virtual classroom it opened right. up a lot of opportunities and we are still using those opportunities like when there is you know rain and we can't have kids come to school we can offer online classes over weekends if you we would like to have some extra classes we can offer them on zoom so yes you know technology has opened up a lot of different avenues and um, all of that but still uh, you need to have like you know the old traditional schooling in place right you know because education is an intense human interaction endeavor and for any kind of learning to be successful you need two way interaction between students and teachers and with traditional schooling there is a very close and focused interaction between students and teachers like look at how many students became depressed during online classes because they mm -hmm. missed the touch they had with their teachers cool. so cool. i don't think we can ever you know say that traditional schooling uh, you know is not needed anymore and we can always we can all be online and we can learn no we cannot learn the same way um, as we can in in person classes but yes uh, with uh, with the whole covid and the whole pandemic situation it has opened up a lot of opportunities for us so synchronous learning and asynchronous learning can go side by side and okay. we can have all these tools in uh, present with us so that when we need them we adopt them so when covid cases go up we can go online when there's rain or some you know you know like problem in the city you can go online you know so you can use the online measure but that's not everything that you can depend on you still need your uh, traditional schooling and i think we've all grown up with that and i and maybe that's why we as a generation are more satisfied and more content and there is more depression in the next generation because you know they've lived most of their lives on social media everything mm -hmm. is about how you look how you know and a lot of different things and there's a lot of competition and then they were online for the past 2 years so i feel like socially and emotionally they're not as healthy as our generation i mean this is my opinion and that that has a lot to do with what they have faced in the past 2 to 3 years so yes edtech tools are very important they make life very easy and uh, or everything that we've learned during covid will help us in future but we still need traditional schooling kids need to meet their teachers they need to meet their you know friends that is very important i think you're absolutely right and and thank you for pointing it out and uh, putting it out that way uh ke the traditional schooling is the traditional way of teaching is going to stay there and the edtech tools could actually help us you know meet our objectives um, yeah. in a, in support a us. more effective manner hmm exactly. they kind of support, support learning yeah they support learning like for example mm -hmm. if you have an sis like a student information system it can do your work like really fast right you know you enter marks they appear in five different places but they yeah. cannot replace an in person assessment that the teacher has with a child right so they can right. give you that support but they cannot replace the traditional system i feel okay exactly uh however if i were to interview a person who uh had started his own edtech organization i i am sure he would <laughs> there 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 must have been some some disagreement uh yeah. at the same time i also appreciate that uh during the covid times we have been able to you know make sure that our education operations are running and a, a huge uh, shout out to all these education uh, edtech organizations but at the same time i remember i was going through this uh, cnn report and it was mm -hmm. that you know at the uh, uh, they believed that edtech did not turn out to be as effective as uh, they had anticipated and mm -hmm. i remember i was in a discussion with uh, uh, with with another person within with an educationist in lahore and they were telling me the same thing that across the globe the average completion rate of a course is 16% just a 16% yeah. so i think mm -hmm. all of these things come into play the teachers presence the the, the presence of your peers uh, you mean a living a disciplined life you uh, going waking up in the morning and going to the school going to work or going to school yes definitely you exactly. cannot reach that so i mean yes uh, in covid we didn't have an option so we did with whatever options we had we had online mm -hmm. classes and we did a lot of sessions you know um, like you know on zoom etc and we introduced edtech tools but still it did not replace the old schooling system so everybody is much happier coming back to it now that things yeah, are opening man. up <laughs> bilkul ji and uh, finally before i let you go rukia there's a, there, there's a rapid fire round and okay. you will have to answer uh, the questions very very quickly so question number 1 cedar or kgs 
Cedar, definitely. <laughs> okay. Lahore or Karachi? Oh, that yeah, Karachi. Mm. Big, if it was Karachi or Lums, then it was Lahore. <laughs> what? You did your bachelor's in Lahore. You should have said Lahore. <laughs> but that was just four years, right? <laughs> Heart is in Karachi. <laughs> Heart is in Karachi. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, O levels or metric? O levels. Okay, Lums or IBA? Lums. <laughs> okay, favorite song? Uh, none really, actually. <laughs> Not at the like. Yeah, I've just heard the Coke Studio song. That's really nice. Recently. Tujum. Yeah, yes, to June. That's very nice. Yes. Bilkul sahi, bilkul sahi. Thank you so much, Rukeya, yeah. for, for joining us. I know and uh, that uh, it was a very tiring day for you. And we have been trying to uh, come live together and uh, talk about the education system. And I think the questions that I have asked you, I haven't really asked anybody else. I have <laughs> talked about extensively on the single national curriculum. I've talked about education policy. I've talked about multiple other aspects of the whole education system in Pakistan and across the globe. But these were some really hard hitting, painful questions that you, you, you answered. And I'm really glad that I had on the other side of the screen, you to answer these questions. Thank you once again for joining us, Rubeya. No, no, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Players indeed are all ours. And at the same time, I'd like to let our audience uh, know that inshallah on 16th February, we'll be coming live again with the uh, with the episode four of Out Loud with Amar podcast series. We'll have Mr. Badr Khushnood, who is the chairman of Pakistan Software Houses Association. And we'll talk about, we'll, we'll also try to talk about the edtech, but we'll talk about the overall IT sector of Pakistan and how it is evolving. So take good care of yourselves. Inshallah, we'll see you on 16th. Allah Thank you. Bye-bye.